Uh, I have with me uh, the executive director of US CISA, Brandon Wills. And um, this is a bit different doing a fireside chat when I'm not on a TV screen and I'm actually wearing <laughs> pants. So this is great. <laughs> Very excited. Um, so what we'll do, similar to what we do in our webinar series, um, we'll go through. So what we want to really focus on here is you know, CISA. A lot of folks in the room here don't know exactly what CISA does. So this is a great opportunity for you to share what CISA does, how it works with industry, works with government, and then how you can work with CISA to help better protect your data and also your network systems. So with that, um, Brandon, I'm not going to read your bio. We already have that. Instead, what we'd like to know, and we do this in the classroom anytime we have a guest speaker, is you know, we want to know your background. How did you get involved with cybersecurity? And over the years, how have you seen cybersecurity evolve? Sure, that's a good question. And just thank you for inviting me here. I think it is a great platform to talk about the work that we're doing um, on behalf of, of the government and, and to improve the overall health and security and resilience of the cyber ecosystem. Uh, so I got involved in the cybersecurity mission uh, really through our infrastructure work. Uh, I was leading the department's uh, analytic efforts to understand what happens when infrastructure fails or is disrupted, um, looking at how disruptions propagate in complex systems, uh, using modeling and simulation techniques to evaluate uh, critical nodes within systems. Uh, and as part of that, we were looking at uh, how cyber events had the same or different impacts on infrastructure than physical events like terrorism, uh, terrorist attacks or, or natural hazards, um, and was asked in 2012 to lead an effort for the government to identify the critical infrastructure where cybersecurity event could cause catastrophic impacts on public health and safety, the economy, or national security. Uh, and since then, have been heavily focused on, on the cybersecurity mission uh, at the department, focusing uh, one on, on those issues around how do we understand what happens when cyber events affect critical infrastructure, uh, supporting the, the department secretary and thinking about how to advance the, the cybersecurity mission of the, of the entire department. And then uh, for the last few years within CISA, focusing on um, directly supporting the critical infrastructure community uh, as they tackle the most significant cybersecurity uh, trends. I think in terms of the evolution of cybersecurity, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I would say the biggest change in cybersecurity is kind of the, the public awareness of the, of the challenges we face. I think that was certainly helped uh, in an unfortunate way over the past year with some of the more significant ransomware attacks like Colonial and JBS Foods that really made it a front page uh, uh, news for, for a good portion of the public that I think in the past had kind of um, uh, mostly ignored it. Um, second kind of evolution that I've seen uh, is, is one really about kind of the complexity and the, and the challenges between what we can expect small and medium-sized businesses to be able to do and small government agencies, uh, local communities, and um, uh, the, the burden that really needs to be borne by large companies and the government. Um, we're in an environment where uh, the adversaries uh, have so much capability, and I think Director Ray covered that um, uh, fairly extensively, uh, that the mismatch between what they can bring to bear and, and the challenges facing uh, the kind of the small players in this environment who are all enabled by uh, IT and OT systems uh, means that there now needs to be a kind of a special burden on the government and big companies, those that have broad visibility into cyberspace, those that have the ability to take action at scale and protect and defend uh, small and medium-sized companies, but even you know large companies in multiple sectors that have deep supply chains where they're relying upon small and medium-sized companies that no longer have the ability necessarily to fully defend themselves. And so I think um, this is an evolution without a clear answer yet, but um, I think it is one where uh, we're thinking a lot about how do we change that dynamic uh, to better help uh, those companies that are really on the front lines but don't necessarily have the tools that they need uh, to, to do battle against our most uh, capable adversaries. Excellent. Um, and before we jump in, I'll just give you some stats uh, to cheer you all up. Um, <laughs> according to Gartner, uh, cybercrime was projected to cost $6 trillion in 2021. Cybersecurity Ventures predicts global cybercrime costs will reach $10.5 trillion annually by 2025. They also estimate that and project ransomware costs will reach $265 billion by 2031. 
Um, they, they also predict there will be an attack every two seconds as ransomware perpetrators progressively refine their malware payloads and related extortion activities. Um, approximately 37% of global organizations said they were the victim of some form of uh, ransomware attack in 2021. And uh, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center reported a 62% year-over-year increase of ransomware attacks from 2020 to 2021. So my question to you, Brandon, is how are you going to fix it? No, I'm really kidding. <laughs> uh, no, my question, Brandon, is uh, <laughs> with that, so organization, you, now you know what you're up against. <laughs> so really, um, can you give us an overview of CISA, okay? You know, talk about what you generally do, what you do with the government, and then really how you work with critical infrastructure and private organizations. Sure, and so CISA has a relatively new agency uh, formed in 2018, but uh, has a long history in the department uh, building capability over time uh, until kind of Congress uh, kind of coalesced us around uh, kind of our current incarnation. Um, we've got a couple of big mission areas that we work and execute. Um, uh, we provide kind of operational lead for cybersecurity for the federal civilian executive branch. So you can think of uh, federal systems that are not managed by DOD or the IC. Um, and that means we spend a lot of time working with federal agencies. There are 102 federal civilian executive branch agencies of size going from big ones like DHS and DOJ down to micro small agencies like the Marine Mammal Commission, um, and having to work on the cybersecurity of, of, of all kinds. Um, we are also um, uh, the national coordinator for critical infrastructure security and resilience. And that really means that we are working across the critical infrastructure community um, to help provide guidance and expertise and advice on how to make sure that our infrastructure is as secure and resilient uh, as possible and bringing together the government agencies that have leadership uh, for those sectors uh, like the Department of Energy for the energy sector or the Department of Treasury for the financial services sector uh, to make sure that we are working in a kind of cohesive way uh, to, to kind of tackle the critical infrastructure challenges that we have. Um, uh, and that kind of bleeds into the broader cybersecurity mission we have at the national level uh, where our job really is uh, to support the critical infrastructure. Our job is to provide them information, technical assistance, uh, incident response support if they need it, vulnerability help. Um, uh, you know, we've got a variety of missions, but it's all about enabling the community to do their jobs better, to enabling network defenders to be successful when they're up against uh, capable adversaries. Um, and uh, that's one that forces us to work in extremely close partnership with, with our interagency partners. Mm -hmm. FBI is probably our closest partner, and we talk to them literally every day, both at headquarters down in DC and, and in our field uh, across the country. Um, and it's really about kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, we're both there to make sure that we're securing the, the nation's critical infrastructure. Their job is to kind of go after the adversary, know about them, know what, know what they're doing, and what we can do to disrupt their operations. And we're there to support um, and help victims get back up and running more quickly and help make sure that the next potential victim is able to stop an attack before it's successful. All right, so you mentioned helping the community, and that leads me to my next question. You know, can you talk about CISA regions, you know, what that is, um, what they do, and how they're being staffed? Sure, no, um, and we've had a field presence for a long time, but we are dramatically increasing its focus on, on cybersecurity. So um, starting back 15 years ago, we started putting security advisors out throughout the country, and for a long time, they were very focused on uh, physical security and resilience questions, supporting uh, active shooter training and bomb-making awareness training, um, doing sec physical security assessments at critical infrastructure sites across the country, again, being born out of 9-11 when the department first stood up, taking on a more of a broader resilience mission in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Um, but uh, starting about five years ago, we started to deploy cybersecurity advisors uh, throughout the country uh, to provide that same degree of support uh, to the, the companies and, and local governments throughout the country. Uh, a year and a half ago, we started putting out state cybersecurity coordinators to really be belly buttons to work with uh, government agencies uh, in all 50 states. 
Um, and now we've kind of coalesced that around the series of 10 regional offices. We've got a regional director, uh, Matt McCann for region one who's up here. Um, and we have a chief of cybersecurity who manages all the cybersecurity advisors um, and our state cybersecurity coordinators. And again, they are a resource for the community, whether that's local governments and state governments, whether that's the critical infrastructure in the affected area. And our security advisors, both physical and cyber, are out there every single day um, uh, being there to support communities. So whether it's doing uh, training at a synagogue to, for active shooter, which we did one at the Tree of Life synagogue actually a few weeks before the, the event um, uh, that uh, the, the active shooter event that they actually had in, in Philadelphia, um, and uh, helping to have folks understand that, or whether it's doing a cyber resiliency review with a company to help them understand where they may have critical weak points that they may want to work on to improve their cybersecurity. We want those people to be a resource. So uh, if you don't know uh, Daniel King, our chief of cybersecurity for this area, if you don't know your cybersecurity advisor for your local community, uh, reach out to us. They're standing over there on the side, Matt and, Matt and Dan, um, and they can, they can help you um, uh, make the right contacts and, and get the support that, that you require. No, that's great because you really, that's a 100% increase because before all we had was Ron Ford. <laughs> before that was Mike Leaking and uh, now we have two. And is the more staff coming? Yeah, this is one of the areas of strategic growth for us at the agency is making sure that we're expanding our field footprint, mm -hmm. um, particularly in cybersecurity where we don't have, I think, the, the number of people that we want across the country. Mm -hmm. And so every cybersecurity advisor is stretched a little thin. Uh, trying to run around and kind of cover pretty big, uh, big, big, big chunks of territory. Great. I have a cache of students who will be <laughs> duly applying for jobs shortly. We're, we're always hiring. <laughs> Good. Perfect. <laughs> All right. No um, ties required. No. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, <laughs> so we talked about the region. Let's talk about the resources, initiatives, and outreach. Um, you know, first off, uh, how do you really work with critical infrastructure? Are you going out to them? Are they coming to you? It's, it's, it's going to be a mixture. There are going to be critical infrastructure that we want to reach out to, whether because mm -hmm. they are of particular criticality and we think a relationship with them is, is going to be important. Um, uh, could be they want to come to us because they, they need assistance and they want to see what kind of services we can provide. Um, could be that there's been an incident that we've detected through intelligence sources and means or our own collection, and us and the FBI are going to go out there and talk to them about what's happened. Uh, so there's a variety of different ways in which we'll potentially make contact. Uh, you could reach out to your, to your CSA or your protective security advisor to, to start that conversation. Um, but once you do, it's all about understanding kind of what you need and how we can provide support. We offer a range of technical services uh, that are needed by some, but not everyone. Uh, a lot of companies, particularly the larger ones, uh, tend to have a lot of their own uh, organic capability. That's great. Uh, for some of the smaller companies, they generally require more assistance. They want more hand-holding. They'll ask for the assessments that we provide. They'll ask for the vulnerability scanning services that, that we offer. Um, and for the bigger companies, they tend to want more information sharing. They want to have that relationship so that if we identify something is happening, um, uh, if we get some indicators of, of compromise that could be useful to them, that they get that information more quickly. We've got a variety of different programs designed uh, to enable that uh, to, to, to happen. Okay, so uh, I'm a mid-sized bank. I'm up here in Boston, and I want to reach out to Dan and Matt. Um, what can they do for me? You talked about, you know, I know there's the whole initiative with Shields Up, and you can talk about that. Um, but what type of services would they offer me? You know, and I know they're not a consulting firm. <laughs> that's not what it is. Uh, but how can they help me? Part of the critical infrastructure, mid-size. I don't have the resources, and I don't have the money to bring in you know, some of the big vendors to uh, secure my system. Sure, and I think what we want to do is you want to work with every company in terms of what makes sense for them. What, are they, what can they do for themselves, and where, where do they think they have potential gaps? And I think we have a range of services, some that are um, uh, very scalable, meaning we can kind of deploy that to as many people as needed, and some that are more bandwidth intensive on our end, and there's a waiting list for those. So on the, on the, on the scalable side, we have things like our vulnerability scanning or 
web application scanning where we look for vulnerabilities every uh, weekly as we scan for new vulnerabilities on forward-facing internet um, uh, sites. Uh, or we can do kind of phishing assessments or remote penetration tests. These are services that we can kind of scale fairly broadly using automated tools that we've deployed at uh, down in DC. Um, on the other end of the of the of the um, uh, Spectrum is our more intense services where we do design architecture reviews and vulnerability assessments uh, where it takes time for, we usually have people on site uh, for several days and they're doing more detailed analysis of what's actually there um, and provide a roadmap for uh, improvements in security at those, at those sites. Um, uh, again, we have limited bandwidth for those, so we tend to prioritize those where we think we um, either it's really important for us to do because we're seeing heavy threat activity in that sector uh, or because we are trying to do enough of those around the country to have a general sense of common vulnerabilities that are in place in medium-sized banks um, and think we need to do a handful of those to get a better sense of what are the common vulnerabilities, what are the common weaknesses, so that when we provide advice and guidance and best practices that they are um, as sharp as possible, that they're going to resonate with that community and that they're going to hit the types of, of weaknesses and vulnerabilities that are actually present out there. Um, and so that's kind of the way in which we kind of think about how do we provide some of those services. Um, I will say that a, ver a lot of what we do is designed to be publicly available. So we put out a lot of our information and, and best practices um, on our website. They're shared very broadly by our uh, field personnel to the networks that they've established in their regions because we want that information to get out at such a low level. When you think back to what I started on earlier, um, every large company is, is enabled by a, a supply chain that starts with a small mom and pop shop that makes something and works its way up, uh, vendors, et cetera. And so we want our information to go to network defenders, whether they're at a Fortune 100 company or at the, they're, at a, they're at a small firm. Um, and so we put out a lot of information that's publicly available. Um, uh, you know, but we do maintain kind of some information sharing circles which are a little bit tighter um, and where we have kind of a vetted community and share that information. And I think that's part of what you get to when you start engaging with our field-based personnel, start to become part of that community so you can get earlier awareness of things before we're ready to push them out uh, to a public audience. All right, well, we have about 100 attorneys here in the room, so if there's a slip and fall, it's, you're in the right spot. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I can already see the question coming up. Hey, these are great resources that you're offering, cyber assessments and things along those lines. Well, it, it, you're not a regulator, right? Um, is that information foyable, or is that something that regular, regulators could get their hands on? So there, there is ways to provide us information that has protections from uh, regulation um, uh, from, from regulators and enforcement. Um, uh, and when you work with us, we kind of go over how to submit information in a way that's uh, protected from disclosure under FOIA laws and from, uh, from regulators. Um, and, you know, but I think that a lot of what we're doing is really kind of enabling the company. We're there to provide support to that company so that it can do its job better. It can make better risk-informed decisions, and it can better target scarce resources into the places that matter. Um, you know, CISA um, is not a regulator. We're not out here to be punitive against any company for their cyber weaknesses. We are all about trying to find ways to support and enable those companies to do their jobs better. Excellent. And um, you talked about information sharing. Um, can you talk up about, first off, you know, CISA, uh, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of uh, 2015, you know, how's that working? And then talk really a bit about the benefits of information sharing. Uh, I know there's been you know, some struggles with information sharing uh, from private organizations to the government. Can you, you know, make your pitch here to the audience here, why it's important to have information sharing and why it benefits not just you know, CISA, but it benefits all of us here. Sure. So, um, CISA 2015 was a legislation designed to remove some barriers to sharing cyber threat indi indicators with the government. Um, so, it provided industry with liability protection for sharing indicators with us. Um, industry had asked for that. Congress gave it to them. Do I think that that liability protection was kind of super critical in holding back the, the dam, uh, you know, the floodwaters? No. Um, but I think it was designed to say, let's remove as many barriers as we can to encourage companies to share threat indicators uh, with the US government. Um, and 
information sharing is a perennial challenge uh, in multiple contexts, cybersecurity, especially because of the speed and scale at which uh, we're talking about here. I think our case for information sharing, I think, is, is quite simple. Um, it is really hard in the moment for a company who has been impacted, uh, who's kind of seeing threat activity on their network, or who has been the subject of a cyber incident, uh, but it is critical for every other company uh, that's operating. Um, and uh, the value proposition for them is, today we need you to share information you're seeing on your network mm -hmm. so that we can get that information, anonymize it, and get it out to the broader community so that other potential victims are not next on that malicious actor's uh, target list. Tomorrow, you're not going to be the victim. You're going to be the one who wants that information from someone else. And you're really going to hope that that person's general counsel is not telling them, don't share the information with the government, uh, because then you know, we're, you're just enabling more attacks to happen. Uh, and so you know, kind of going back to earlier conversation, CISA is not here to kind of use information that you provide with us uh, to penalize you for, for what you're doing. We want that information to protect the community, to protect the ecosystem. Our job is to get information out as quickly as possible, um, uh, as broadly as possible, to help network defenders stop the next attack. I mean, I think our ultimate goal throughout all of this is that no attack should be successful more than once. Um, stop as many as we can, but if it happens the first time, that information needs to be shared quickly so that other potential victims are not, uh, are not ultimately targeted. Um, and that, that, is, that is hard, um, and there's not enough of it, I think, you know, um, Director Ray obviously made this point in an impassioned way during his speech, but it's one that we make every day. If you have potential information that's of value, share the information with the government uh, because it will help the overall health of the ecosystem. It takes more bad actors uh, off the playing field and it removes their ability to be successful in, in future attacks. And how do they share that information with you? So there's, again, um, uh, it, will, it will depend. Um, you know, if you have an incident, you can, you can call up uh, CISA, you can go to, you know, send an email to report at CISA.gov, CISA um, uh, you know, contact your, your cybersecurity advisor, you know, use whatever means you can to get that information to us. Uh, the sooner you talk to us, the sooner we can kind of identify the right way of getting the information. If you want to share log files or, or a drive image or something like that, there are ways in which you can do that uh, to get the right technical information to the team. Um, a lot of this information is, is listed on our website at CISA.gov, obviously. Uh, but, you know, make contact with us in some way and we'll walk you through the process of getting the information to us in a way that both protects the information and, and helps support the community. Yeah, and on that too, uh, you shouldn't wait till you get hit and then look up CISA in the contacts. <laughs> uh, you have Matt and Dan here. You should probably get to know them before something happens. Uh, yeah, and I generally tell everyone, you know, um, if the first time you are dealing with a ransomware attack is after you've been hit by a ransomware attack, then it's, it's way too late. You need to start thinking about how you prepare and plan uh, for any type of cyber incident now, whether that means making sure you've got the right connections with the U.S. government, CIS and the FBI. It means making sure that you've got the right incident response plan internally. Uh, you, you know how to use it. You've, op you've tested it. You've exercised it. Um, you know what your assets are. You know where your critical assets are. You know how to segment you know, to the extent that you can protect critical assets in the event you start seeing anomalous activity on networks. Make sure all of that is done ahead of time. Um, because you don't want to be dealing with it right. um, uh, after the incident has already taken over and compromised key parts of, of your business. That was the left of boom <laughs> that the director talked about. Um, all right, uh, so we talked about information sharing organizations to the government. How about the government? Are they sharing information back to the organizations? And how is that going? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that we're doing. Um, uh, for the kind of broader community, again, we're pushing a lot of information out um, uh, more than ever at the kind of public, um, at the public level. And I think that is a recognition working with our government partners in both the FBI and the, in the intelligence community that we need more information more quickly downgraded to get out to the, to the community. Mm -hmm. um, second, we've stood up some new operational sharing relationships with certain <laughs> large companies that have very broad visibility into the cyber ecosystem. So these are the largest cybersecurity firms, the largest cloud providers, the largest internet service providers, the largest technology companies. Uh, relatively small group of around 25 companies, but 
they have extremely broad visibility domestically and, and in large parts globally. Um, we've got a very close sh uh, sharing relationship with them where uh, when we see something, we're sharing it quickly with them, they can provide information back to us, and then we can use that information, again, in an anonymized form and get it out to the entire uh, ecosystem. So, uh, and plus those companies themselves can actually take action to protect tens or hundreds of thousands of their customers without their end customers even knowing it. So I often use an example, it's really hard to get 56,000 water utilities to make a uh, uh, cybersecurity improvement, but if 30,000 of them are using Microsoft Defender and we can share information with Microsoft, they can load it in Defender and now it protected 30,000 companies. Um, immediately, that's a, a huge win. So having a relationship with the, with the companies that have uh, that kind of visibility, that kind of scale, um, is really critical to kind of the level of broad protection that I, think, um, that I think we need. And it's one way in which we're gathering additional information, enabling it in that environment, and then sharing it more broadly for everyone to benefit with um, uh, down the road. All right, um, and on the sharing of government information, there's always this talk of overclassification. Um, and that way, organizations can't get information because they don't have the specific clearances. Is there any talk or is there anything in works where you know, maybe CISOs could get that type of top secret clearance or a lesser classification of information to get it out to better protect uh, organizations? So I'll say a couple of things on this. And having seen our you know, declassification of, of information in a variety of contexts uh, over my career at DHS, and I would say kind of in the cyber realm, um, it is working better than any other environment that I've, that I've seen. Um, one, we are getting more information at the unclassified level um, um, faster than ever. Mm -hmm. um, and that information is getting out extremely quickly. Uh, I think you've seen cases going back to kind of election 2020 where we had highly sensitive information on mm -hmm. Iranian operations that were looking to target the election and got that out within hours, um, not days. Uh, you saw a lot of information shared uh, over the past several months related to potential Russian threats to U.S. critical infrastructure and obviously Russian preparedness for invasion of, of, of Ukraine. Um, again, that information moving from highly classified to pushing out information to the community more quickly. That being said, if we do need to share classified information, um, we, we will. Uh, so, you know, in the last few months as we were engaging in, in preparedness for a potential Russian um, uh, cyber retaliation against the homeland. We were uh, worked with the FBI and, and did classified briefings for uh, sectors potentially threatened where we did one-time read-ins for um, a couple of hundred uh, critical infrastructure owners and operators so that they had the available information that they need. Um, but we also have cleared uh, a couple of thousand critical infrastructure owners and operators across the country. Uh, again, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, I would say certainly at the top secret level, we often use those people to help us hone our message. Um, again, you know, if you bring in 20 people into a room uh, to share some highly sensitive top secret information, uh, they're not, there's not going to be a lot they're going to do with that information, but they can help us make sure that when we're ready to release that information at the unclassified level, uh, that that message is ready to resonate, that that, 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 that message is more targeted, um, and that ultimately it, it has the right level of uptake that we need. And so um, I, I would... I'm confident in saying that the community should be, should be comfortable with how we work with classified information, that the information, even if it is classified, is able to be actioned quickly. And certainly, if there is ever a victim of a cyber attack, classification has never held back CIS or the FBI from showing up at that facility and letting them know that they're a victim. OK. Uh on the information sharing side too, can you talk a bit about you know information sharing and analysis centers, ISACs, versus uh, information sharing and analysis organizations? Yeah, so and uh, how are they working with CISA too? Sure. So ISACs have a long history, I think, dating back to uh, a, a presidential directive that was actually signed by President Clinton. I want to say in 1996. Um, first creating kind of critical infrastructure sectors and designating uh, these information sharing and analysis centers, which really is designed to be kind of points of collaboration within that sector so that, that we could share information with an ISAC and they could get it out to the, um, to the, to the companies that are in those uh, sectors. Um, there has been a lot of growth and maturation and development of, of ISACs over the past uh, 20 plus years, um, including 
um, uh, ones that are extremely sophisticated in sharing threat information, ones like the Financial Services ISAC or the Energy ISAC that have kind of deep information sharing resources and, and capabilities that they've built. Um, and a few years ago, there was a desire to kind of expand the ISAC model to other kind of groups that wanted to form. So it didn't necessarily need to be all focused around a sector model. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's an information sharing and analysis organization of, you know, higher education organizations. There's one of law firms. So there's a lot of different ways in which um, groups of, of um, entities want to come together to say we want to work on information sharing and improve uh, how that works, and we want to make sure we've got a central point to work uh, with the government and with each other. Uh, so CISA has an extremely close relationship with the with the ISAC and ISAC community. Uh, there's a national council of ISACs that we work with uh, regularly. We provide them a lot of information. Uh, ISACs often have membership on the um, on our sector councils that we've established uh, to provide us an easy way of engaging with them on an ongoing basis to collaborate on, on, on projects. Um, and really, we think of them as a really critical resource in helping us get that last mile. Um, we don't always have confidence, even with several hundred security advisors deployed throughout the country, that we always have the sufficient connections with every single critical infrastructure in this country. And ISACs are another vehicle to make sure that uh, we get information to them and they can get it out to all the companies that are parts of, of that ISAC or that ISAO. Yeah. And now with the ISAC, uh, they're industry specific. So are they sharing information outside of their industry? So for the FS ISAC, the financial services, are they sharing it with the educational side? So, uh, you know, I think that's where we've encouraged more um, cross-sector dialogue than ever. Um, uh, we often see that during a lot of the exercises, including ones that are held by specific sectors. So I just took part a few months ago in the, a major um, exercise for the energy sector called GridX, and they've brought in uh, the financial services, the, the telecommunications sectors into that to enable kind of better cross-sector sharing uh, because of the dependencies and interdependencies that exist uh, amongst the various sectors. I would say um, ISACs are beginning to share information amongst each other, uh, but frankly, a lot of that kind of inter, um, uh, a lot of that kind of cross-sector sharing is actually happening at the local level. Uh, because at a local level, your local chemical plant is going to probably have a closer relationship with their electric power supplier than they are with a competing power plant two states away that may be on the same ISAC as, as, as them. So a lot of that information in communities um, is happening, and I think that's really um, fantastic. That's where it needs to happen because those are the actual points uh, where you have concentrated risk, where you can have disruptions propagating in those systems, and where you want to make sure uh, that those companies that have those dependencies and interdependencies have enough uh, of a relationship to make sure that they can um, be aware when something's going wrong and they can have plans for how to support uh, should there be disruptions. Perfect. And now with the information sharing and analysis organizations, what's the difference with that? I, there really isn't necessarily a difference. The, the, the concept is the same, just ISACs was, was kind of a term of art around those kind of sector-focused uh, uh, organizations. And now when you have things that are kind of outside of the sector model, we want it to just be more generic and could be any group of companies who wanted to come together to form uh, an information sharing organization should be able to do so. Perfect. All right, uh, we have limited time here. So now I'll lead you on to the, uh, the Cyber Incident Reporting and Critical Infrastructure Act of 2022. Another regulation, <laughs> great. Um, can you talk a bit about that uh, and what that is, you know, and entails there's, there's new reporting requirements, there's reporting on ransomware, um, there's council set up, and uh, also there could be possible penalties as well. Sure, so um, I think as you heard from both me and from, from, from Director Ray, uh, we don't see enough of what's happening in the cyber ecosystem in the United States. Um, uh, I think the current estimates are somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of cyber incidents are reported to the government. Um, and so there is a significant amount of cyber activity that's happening across the country that we don't have visibility of. Um, and what that means is that we, have, uh, we can't spot adversary campaigns early. Uh, we can't render assistance as quickly. Uh, there's less information for us to share um, uh, on, on the tactics that our adversaries are using. Uh, and so the U.S. government has been working with Congress for the past few years trying to get them to understand the importance of um, having some type of mandatory incident reporting. And so this legislation, uh, which was passed earlier this year, requires um, that uh, companies will have to provide information, uh, critical infrastructure companies 
well, to provide information on cyber incidents uh, within 72 hours uh, to CISA. Um, and then there are obligations on us to then work with our federal agency partners to make sure that information is appropriately mm -hmm. uh, shared within inside the U.S. government. It also requires the sharing of any ransomware payments within 24 hours. Again, going back to the earlier conversation from Director Ray, the earlier that kind of information is shared, uh, the more tools that the federal government has uh, to take action, whether to identify the perpetrator, potentially get the money back, um, and those tools, whether from the FBI or the Secret Service, um, are, are perishable, and so time is really of the essence. Uh, this, this new authority um, uh, will requires us to go through a full rulemaking process, so uh, this requirement is, is not yet in force. Um, we've got two years to publish a, a, the draft rulemaking, the notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, and, then a, and then in 18 months after that to publish a final rule. Obviously, we're going to try to move a little bit more quickly than that, but um, anyone who's been through the rulemaking process knows that it is neither fun nor fast nor easy. Uh, and so uh, we'll be working on that pretty aggressively for the next few years. Um, is that I, something um, you're going to take uh, insights from academia or private industry where they can you know, provide... Uh, feedback? Yeah, there, there'll be a number of opportunities for for private sector to provide mm -hmm. feedback. Um, we're working on what that uh, plan looks like right now, um, but I expect um, people will start hearing from us extremely quickly uh, mm -hmm. to begin to identify ways in which we're going to be soliciting industry input and, and anyone else. I mean, this, this regulation affects uh, not just um, private sector, but it affects um, public sector organizations at state and local levels. Um, and I think there are, you know, there are some big questions that we've got to answer as part of this rulemaking. So one off the top, you know, what is a covered entity? Who are going to be the ones that are going to be required to report? What are the triggers for reporting? What exact information is going to be required? Um, and so we're going to be soliciting input um, on that um, probably in a couple of different ways. And then uh, once we publish the draft rulemaking uh, for public comment, uh, obviously we'll be looking for, for comments from, uh, from anyone who wants to weigh in on how we can make sure that the final rule uh, kind of achieves its goals in a way that's, um, I think, uh, uh, as, as light an impact mm -hmm. on companies while still providing the kind of critical information we need uh, to execute our mission. So we think it's an incredibly important piece of legislation that will, over the long term, really be a, um, a, a seismic change in our ability to understand what's happening and to really not just understand, but use that information to take action, uh, take action against the adversaries and take action to protect, uh, protect the U.S. critical infrastructure. Perfect. And you started off with, you're not a regulator, you know, and there are possible penalties. So if I'm a company and I don't report within 72 hours, um, you know, how's that going to work? Yeah, so the, the legislation, for those of you who kind of waded through it, um, has, 100 lawyers in <laughs> has, a, has a couple of, uh, you know, again, the, this is not collecting this information to be punitive. We're not trying to use that information to penalize any company, nor do we have the authority to do so. We are collecting that information really to enable our voluntary mission. It is additional information that's pumping into CISA that helps us share more uh, with the community um, to, to make the community stronger. Um, if we get wind of an incident that uh, has not been reported to us, we, have, we will send out, our, the legislation kind of has like tiers where first we can just request that that company provide us the information that they have not done so to date. Um, then we have the ability to issue an administrative subpoena um, to, to gather the information. Um, and then if there are still challenges, um, you know, we would pass it over to the Department of Justice who has additional tools they can use to try to gain access to the information. Again, we really don't hope, you know, we hope it doesn't have to come to that. Mm -hmm. um, our goal, again, it's why there's so many stages, is we think that this is really just an issue of um, making sure that they understand what's going to happen with the information that they provided to us, how it's protected, how it will be used, um, and more importantly, how we're going to use it to help them and help everyone else in the community uh, uh, take the cybersecurity challenges they're facing, uh, take you know, take them head, face them head on. All right. So we talked about you know before an event happens, what to do, and then you know reporting over and information sharing. 
what, what would happen? How would I use, utilize CISA if you know, there was a data breach of my systems and I'm a mid-sized bank? How would I utilize you, or would I? Sure, and so I, I think that that very much depends. I think one of the things right now is we used to do a lot more incident response uh, for private sector companies, uh, but one of the things that has happened over the past 15 years is really a growth in an extremely vibrant cybersecurity community, private sector community, um, and most even medium-sized companies will have a cybersecurity vendor. Um, some of the prominent ones are in this room today. Um, and the they're sponsoring lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and most companies will use those. Uh, what we want to happen is really that we're a resource there. Uh, if we have information, we can provide it. If they need certain assistance from us, uh, we can provide that. Um, and oftentimes we'll often just ask, hey, if you've got a cybersecurity vendor on site, if you're using CrowdStrike or Mandiant or others, um, uh, give them the authority to talk to us about what they found and what they saw. Uh, we'll want to work with them to understand um, not necessarily what, you know, we're not looking for specifics and sharing any kind of proprietary information, but uh, what did Mandy and find about the tactics that the adversary used? How did they escalate privileges? How did they move laterally in the network? Those are the things that, that we're looking for um, because those are the kinds of, that's the kind of information that we're going to use mm -hmm. and that's going to be critical because if it's a new tactic, if it's a new technique, we're going to want to get it out uh, to other folks who could be, who could be victimized. Um, we can um, in certain um, um, you know, in a, in a limited number of cases, really just because of capacity, provide incident response support if a, if a private sector company needs it. Um, now, more than ever, we're doing that kind of remotely. You can share logs and images, et cetera. We can um, tap into networks um, uh, with companies' permission and, and kind of look at what's, what's, what's happened there. Um, but frankly, nowadays, that happens less and less because of the, the growth of the cybersecurity community. And it's more about the partnership between us, uh, that company, and its vendors to make sure that we're sharing information in a way uh, that, that we, could, we could use that information for, for the broader good. Great. And um, before we take questions from the audience, um, what is the one takeaway uh, you would like the audience to have here when you know, collaborating with CISA? You know, what's the one takeaway? The one takeaway is, uh, you know, I would say we are, we are not big or bad, uh, being from the federal government. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, a kinder or gentler uh, federal agency. Uh, but really, we're, we're, we're here to help you. Um, and our only, our only job is to support the critical infrastructure community. That's kind of number one. And we're an agency that was built with partnership in mind uh, from the beginning, and that's really what enables everything that we do. Um, and so you should think of us as a partner because that's the way we want to treat every single one of the, the critical infrastructure community that we work with, every single government agency that we are, uh, that we're, uh, we're working with. Um, and there are a lot that we can do together, uh, but it really requires that kind of relationship to begin, and the sooner you reach out, uh, the more good that we can do together. Perfect. All right, um, do we have any questions from the audience? Sir, if you could, you know, identify yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, could you catch us up on the National Risk Management Center uh, as we're going and you have a vision for where to take it going Sure. So um, uh, the question was about the National Risk Management Center, which CISA um, uh, created in 2019. Um, I think we announced at our first annual cyber summit that year, or maybe it's 2018. 2018, um, and it is designed to provide um, a, uh, a kind of central point for kind of broader risk management issues affecting the, the critical infrastructure community. Um, one of the important projects that it is doing now that I think will pay dividends long into the future um, is a kind of adaptation of what the Cyberspace Laram Commission was calling systemically important critical infrastructure, or SICI. Um, we, Director Easterly, our CISA's director, doesn't like the name Sicky, so we're we're opting for uh, primary. It's pretty catchy. <laughs> it's it's catchy. Um, primary systemically important entities, Pisces. Um, that's better. Pisces is better than Sicky. Yeah. That's all you need to take away from that. Um, and I, I think it's the idea that. Um, we need to have a good understanding about where our points of concentrated risk are across the country. What are those entities that really provide kind of systemic support to some of the functions that underpin 
uh, the American way of life, the economy, our national security. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of years ago, one of the first projects that the National Risk Management Center, or the NRMC, undertook was the identification of these 55 national critical functions. Uh, these things cut across sectors, so they're not using the sector model, although sectors contribute to, to many of, uh, you know, can contribute to many of them. Um, and the idea being, we need to understand that kind of functional model so we can un understand what companies and are, are enabling those functions and where disruptions could really impact uh, the ability for those functions to operate. And I think this is taking it kind of a step down, which is kind of as you look you know, down that chain, what are those really critical crown jewels across all of those critical functions that would have the largest disruptive effect on our ability to maintain kind of continuity of the economy or, or critical services for the country. And so that's a, um, an effort that's underway now. Um, uh, you know, the Cyberspace Clearing Commission had all kinds of ideas about what it wanted to do with, mm -hmm. with entities that were identified. I think for us, um, the first step is identifying them, and the second step is making sure that we're working closely with all of them, um, making sure that they're part of those partnership networks, mm -hmm. that they're part of those information sharing uh, relationships. Um, the NRMC is doing a, a host of, of other things, particularly related to supply chain security, working with um, uh, vendors and customers, looking at ways in which we can have better uh, visibility into critical ICT supply chain uh, supply chains and where we, how we, what we can do to improve our security there. They're working on 5G and others. Um, but I really think the work that they've done on national critical functions and the work that they're now using that to on, on systemically important assets uh, is among the more important things they're going to do over the longer term. Excellent. Other question? Brian. Yeah, it's, I would say that one of the things that we are trying to do, particularly out in the field, and I think this is why we are um, uh, expanding our footprint here, is to make sure that when you are working with us out here, you are doing it in a seamless way. That you, there's no reason for you to make five calls uh, to, to the various federal agencies once you're out here. Um, that if you reach out to CISA or the FBI, uh, we will talk to each other, coordinate, and make sure that you've got a coordinated uh, response that comes back to you, an integrated uh, conversation. I'd say we spend a lot of time making sure that we are not stepping on each other's toes, uh, that we're not double tapping industry, and so um, the, the, the presence of that has dramatically been reduced over the past few years, and I'd say today, um, whenever there's an incident, whenever there is uh, desired outreach, if one side or the other gets notified, uh, there is immediately we'll call the cyber task force, we'll call the FBI cyber division at headquarters and make sure that we get the right field office, coordinating with the right CISA field office, and make sure that that um, engagement should be, from your perspective, seamless. And so I think that's why, uh, you know, I'll often say it's not about, don't, you don't have to call CISA, just call someone in the government and we'll let us worry on the back end to make sure that you hear us speak with, with one voice. It's not gonna be perfect, um, but I don't think we're in a position right now to mandate any one agency be a kind of clearinghouse. There's a, too many kind of uh, unique things that, are, that, are, that need to go on between various government agencies and the unique authorities that they, that they have. Um, but if you do work with us, uh, we'll make sure to, to kind of bring together the entire federal family um, uh, that needs to be there to be part of those conversations. Sometimes it's CISA, the FBI, a, a sector risk management agency like Treasury or, or Department of Energy. Uh, sometimes it'll be kind of local government um, uh, that could be a critical partner in that effort. Uh, so um, I think that's what you, that's, that, that burden is on us um, and uh, uh, let us kind of live up to, to what, we're, what we're holding ourselves to. All right, we'll take one more question, Mark. I can't comment on on the proposed regulation. Um, what I will what I will say is, um, I think it is it is of a vein of kind of what Director Ray and I were talking about. Is that that there needs to be um, broader visibility in terms of what's happening? Um, you know, I 
industry has made no secret. They have some concerns with some aspects of the SEC regulation. Uh, that's not for, for me to judge um, uh, what they're doing. Um, uh, but the, the overall goal is that we live in a complex environment and uh, one in which uh, the adversaries are going to have an advantage if the defensive side doesn't have as much information as possible uh, to enable its activities. And so I think you'll see variety of agencies, um, variety of tools being brought to bear to put more information into the ecosystem so that everyone can make better decisions, uh, whether that's on the government end, whether that's on the private sector side. Excellent. All right, Brandon, thank you so much no, thank for you, stopping Kevin. by. Um, we actually, Doug, there's a gift over there. Doug. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah. We really went all out for you, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we were told to keep it under $20, and yeah, we really did. Uh, take a look. <laughs> Nice. Hey, Thank you. We used to give these out to everyone. Uh, <laughs> then thanks to the supply chain, we got three. <laughs> you got one of them. So thank you so much, thank Brandon. You. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you.